The legend of the Osama Sentai began on September 29th, 2022, when the name was revealed via trademark, like any other normal year in Toku. Upon translation of the name, we got a reveal that the show would be definitely about kings, as the name means King Sentai King Kingjer in English translations. However, our first rumors didn't really indicate this concept, as throughout October, we were told that this season would be based on bugs. To start, there would be six heroes in the beginning, using the Dawn Brother color scheme plus an additional Purple Ranger. More rumors said that the theming would follow robot insect machines in Fantasy Kingdoms, whatever that means. All the Rangers would visually have a secondary color, for example, red would be red with a gold undersuit, and everyone would have swappable armor. This is because their mechas were insects that had a secondary vehicle mode that could be used to create a secondary robot form in addition to the bug robot form. There would also be a coin gimmick following off of Zenkaiger and Dawn Brothers, which would have Legend Sentai powers used in a gun. The additional Purple Ranger was also said to be a spider with its own gun, sword, and jet spider mecha hybrid. At the end of November, we got the reveal of the silhouette for the team, the main five at least. Further rumors said that the transformation device of the season would be a sword, there would be a cell phone belt buckle that summons bug friends, and the belt also had a storage piece for the coins. Those coins lasted a long time as a gimmick, but as we know, that's not what happened. Thanks to toy listings that came out that confirmed a lot of information, we got the name and colors of the first five rangers, indicating that we would be getting a purple main ranger instead of a pink. The first robot was said to be made up of 10 bug mechas, and we would be getting multiple auxiliary bugs afterwards. There were no legacy toys or any gimmicks at all, and thanks to figure listings, we were told there would be a silver stag beetle ranger. Elder Leagues told us that the suits kind of look like rubber. On the December 20th, we got the official first look at the Osama Sentai thanks to the official poster. The TV Asahi write-ups also established that this would be a different kind of Earth with a bunch of different kingdoms that each ranger would be leading throughout the season, and we we're also told that the mecha was also called King Goger in addition to the name of the season. Magazines began to leak and provided a better look at the suits and the mecha. In January, King Goger made its first televised debut, literally as I'm referring to the name of the mecha, which appeared in episode 45 of Avataro Sentai Don Brothers. Like most things in Don Brothers, there was no real explanation for why this happened other than to sell toys as the marketing had begun for this part of the mecha line. In February, the press conference of the season happened, but just a few hours before, we actually got the main cast leaked with the full name of their characters, mentions of Bugnarok and Rackleys. Later that night, we did get the official trailer reveal showing off the unique environments and green screen locations that would be used for this season. We were told that Rackley's would be Silver Okuagata Ogier, but that night we did get a plushy leak Additionally, the Spider Ranger finally made a return in the rumor cycle, but now we were told he would be a white sixth ranger. King Goger would make a brief return in Dawn Brothers once again thanks to a monster design based off of the season and the handoff at the end of the show before the venture into another Earth. Before I talk about some of the more nuanced aspects of King Oger, I want to begin by addressing everyone's favorite green screen environments used in the whole season. <laughs> After dealing with this for 50 episodes in a movie, I mixed on it. I genuinely love that the creators decided to showcase these radically unique kingdoms and environments as much as possible in as many scenes as possible using this brand new technology. A lot of the big environment scenes are honestly practically flawless, like you can tell it's an CG environment, but it looks really impressive, and it's so cool to have these kinds of Sentai moments where they're in these massive, otherworldly locations. Combined with King Goger's actual storyline concepts, the individuality of this show compared to other Sentai seasons is on an unprecedented scale, and it fits right in with this era of weird and experimental seasons, but in a way that none of the other seasons really do. The problem is just that, well, green screen is hard even for multi-million dollar films, so the good-looking scenes in King Goger feel like a bit of a rarity. There's pretty much always this uncanny feeling where a scene doesn't look bad, but there's something like a lack of real sunlight when the characters are supposed to be in the sunniest day imaginable right now, or there's no real depth between them and the room they're supposed to be in, or the room is even just jittering all around when they're doing a fight. I feel like a lot of the green screen fights don't work that well. I try to not let visuals like this affect my feelings for the shows, because let's face
face it, most of these tokusatsu seasons do not have incredible CG because they're kids TV shows. I'm not going to hold it against King Oger, but tokusatsu is a visual medium, so I think it's worth having this discussion since they tried something so different here. I have to say that I got pretty tired of the green screen after the whole show, but I do appreciate and respect the ambition behind it, and there are some incredible moments. So I really would not mind them bringing it back for like large scale environments in future seasons of Sentai, just please don't do it for an entire show, and when you do an action scene, just take us outside. What is funny about this is that the crazy environments are what sold me on the show in the first few episodes. I love that the show's introductory arc wasn't just the standard introduction to each member of the team, I mean it, it was that, but it was also introducing us to this world. Each episode was spent exploring a new kingdom, a whole separate component of this version of Earth, in addition to meeting our new teammates. It also helps that there are a lot of side characters, each king just has their own retainer, and they're not characters I would expect to get big arcs or development. Just the fact they're here wandering around alongside the kings adds to the scope of this universe. It helps to flesh out each kingdom individually. Then after we get acquainted with this world, King Gojo just sorta jumps straight into its plot. King Gojo's visuals are super unique, but its writing is also super unique in my opinion because it's probably the most serialized season of Super Sentai that I've seen at least. I'm sure there are others. The episodes are always contributing something to a larger storyline. I mean, half of them in the first part feel like they could fit as the finale of any other season. The monsters of the week are more like specialized foot soldiers rather than the driving force of a season. The first thing we see in the season is Legend King Oger narrated by the Six Ranger. So the first arc isn't just a fetch quest to sell toys, we're literally building up to this big prophecy over 10 episodes. King Oger is insanely thrilling in its first half because we have these world ending events happening, but we also have this real interesting kingly political action happening. I love the dynamic of the characters in part 1, revealing that Gira is the prince early on was incredibly satisfying because it kind of felt like something they'd save for later on, but no, it happens in the first five episodes and changes the entire trajectory of the show. Yanma is easily the best Blue Ranger of the last five or so years because he, he actually does stuff. I love this camaraderie with Gear Up because they just both hate Rackley so much, but he's also just a plain badass and I love how he's the mechanic of the team. Himeno is super connected to the lore thanks to the Fury of the Gods being her whole back story, so I was super interested in her character and seeing her unravel this mystery. Meanwhile, Kaguragi acts a bit more like an anti-hero, but not in the sense he actively fights against the King Ogers. It's more like when he fights with them against the Bugnarok, you're not sure where his motives truly lie. I know Rita is a fan favorite, and I agree, I, I really liked Rita, but I never see anyone like them for the same reasons that I like them. Like, everyone just seems to like the Mofun thing or think they're a badass, but for me, it's specifically that one focus episode about Karas that does it for me. That episode is super subtle about how Rita is like the only king that never actually considered themselves worthy. Hiding the affinity for Mofun in the random screams aren't just these quirky parts of their character, they had to prematurely become the chief justice of the world while still being this scared little kid. So the screams are because they're still a child mentally, they don't want to do anything because they've never had a childhood. So Mofun is almost like this coping mechanism and also a remnant of that lost childhood. Then Jeremy is one of my favorite six rangers ever just because he's so ingrained into the plot. He's literally the first character that ever speaks in the season but we don't know he's the six ranger until he debuts and then when he debuts he reveals that the whole main plot to acquire Legend King Goger that has been happening for the entire season up till now has all been a ruse started by him to herald his advent as spider kumonos. Every year I see people try to guess which member of the main cast is going to end up being the six ranger and it's really funny because they always just cast a new person for that and technically they did that this year but also technically they didn't because again it was the narrator the whole way through and no one guessed it would be the narrator <laughs> and I also quite like that he remains as the narrator he becomes a part of the show now but he's still starting every episode and there's some moments where he literally looks at the camera and is like that's it for this episode his actor was so charismatic as well and it really adds to this character's performance and there's also the whole thing about him being half Bugnarok which added an interesting side to his relationships to everyone. Speaking of the Bugnarok, they're whatever. I only found Deathnarok interesting like 
two episodes before he dies. I think they should have established his relationship with Jeremy when he debuted so that they could have a bit more of a rivalry or something with Jeremy's ascension to the throne. None of the other Bugnarok have any personality worth mentioning except Kamijin, but he's just kind of a silly guy. The real star of the villains and this entire season to me was Big Rax. He was a textbook satisfyingly easy villain to hate, but like it was so good that I couldn't help but be captivated by his theatrics. I know Giro is the good guy because I've been watching him from the comfort of my home actually be a good guy, but if I wasn't, I don't know. Rackleys does not do a horrible job at convincing the people, and that's what makes him so fun to watch. The way he is used as a villain in tandem with the Bugnarok is also what propelled him to the top for me. The Bugnarok are more or less just generic Sentai monster villains that pop into episode to give an excuse to market some toys, which is maybe kind of why I don't think of them as a very interesting villain. The main plot of episodes would often be the Osama Sentai trying to figure out how they can fight back against Rackleys without actually fighting him or else they brand themselves as traitors like Gira. Gira is basically the main character and his main conflict is his quest to defeat Big Rax and become the Shugatum King. So more often than not, Rackleys feels like the main antagonist of this season because the heroes have way more personal conflicts regarding his defeat, but since Rackleys isn't aligned with the Bungrock for the most part, he's still on the same side as the King Gojers, kind of, so it makes all the conflicts way more complex and so satisfying to see unfold, but it also lays the groundwork for a truly incredible Incredible character. I think my biggest issue with King Gojo's first half is just the pacing. There were some moments where it felt like they were trying to stay true to the episodic nature of a Sentai, so some episodes will end with a huge plot implication that the next episode will focus on someone else entirely, and then the plot implication is only picked up at the end again to move into the next episode, so it kind of makes some character development feel misplaced, but I'm not sure where else you would put it. That also applies to some of the ideas used as the climax of part one. I do think it's genuinely cool that they decide to wrap up so many of these plot lines quickly instead of dragging them out throughout 50 episodes. I would have never predicted Gira could defeat Rackleys and ascend to being king before the halfway point of the show, but what do you know, that's what they do. I also love that the final mecha debuts at this point so it functions as a sort of last minute super finale robot, something that they probably wouldn't have actually done, at least using the new toy, but if it's the mid-season finale, you can go for it. I just feel like the story sort of me meanders as we reach this point. Gira is king, Rackleys is gone, what's left? It's cool that there was an attempt to establish this clean cut between the two parts, but this rush to establish a new status quo instead of maybe fleshing out some more of the character's backstory feels, well, rushed, and sort of created more problems in the long run. But I'll admit the decision to split the show into chapters like this was kind of a stroke of genius, and at the time, I was really excited to see what they could do. Even though I wasn't a massive King Gojo fan before Chapter 2, I was genuinely excited to see where they could go, and I thought the show was solid up to that point. But I think the only way I can describe my feelings toward this portion of the show is heartbreak. For some background going in, Kamen Rider loves to do these big arc shakeups these days, but Super Sentai really doesn't do that. It stays pretty consistent the whole way through, which I do love, but I like that they decided to switch it up here. For King Gojo, they line the split up with the real world finale of Kamen Rider Geats and the premiere of Kamen Rider Gotchard. They created a whole new poster showcasing the cast in brand new outfits. They gave a whole new poster to an entirely new villain faction. They teased an upcoming crossover. Just the simple fact that Gira's orphan clothes would be replaced by Big Rax's clothes to signify his kingliness was incredibly satisfying to me. Additionally, Chapter 1 left some interesting ideas on the table to follow up on. Obviously, there's the Fury of the Gods, but that's kind of the whole crux of this. Some other interesting notes were Gira's decision to be a real king, not just a tyrant, and Jeremy establishing himself as a Bugnarok king. Chapter 2 does not provide any sort of satisfying conclusion to either of these ideas. Gira keeps doing the tyrant king act thing, but like, for who? Bugnarok Kingdom. This is easily the most disappointing part of the entire show to me. We never get to see the Bugnarok Kingdom in a normal way, or how the world has changed now that the Bugnarok are living among the other human citizens. 
citizens. After this entire show opens up with some of the greatest world building I've ever seen in a tokusatsu season, the setup was right there to redo the whole thing and improve on it even more by establishing the sixth kingdom. Let's see Jeremy working with some bug rock. Let's see Garojim like, hey, Jeremy, you have to do this for today. Oh, I sorry, I can't. I have to go meet with the other kings. Instead, bug rock kingdom is just Jeremy's throne room? We see the catacombs again later, but that's treated as a new thing. What was the kingdom like before the galact insects? We never know. Like, I want to see what the kingdom was like before these events happened. What was the world like normally? So when the shakeup happens, it actually feels like a shakeup, not just, oh, I guess this is happening now. Everyone loves to bring up this one point when Jeremy sacrifices Bugnarok kingdom as an amazing character moment, but for me, it meant nothing because we never get to see what Bugnarok Kingdom actually was, or how it affected Jeremy's life, or the other King Oger's lives. Bugnarok Kingdom is no more, okay? It is one single room that no one goes to, and there's no citizens in there. What has been affected? Nothing! And then the Bugnarok are still treated as enemies because of, like, Grody's summons? I know they're not real Bugnarok, but it's so bizarre to try and push this narrative that the Bugnarok are friends now, but we continue to utilize these suits as bad guys. At one point, I think they straight up kill, like, a normal Bugnarok with King Kyoryuzin. It's so frustrating to me because, as I said, Jeremy is probably one of the greatest six strangers we've had, and this doesn't actively ruin his character. It's just like all of this extra potential to make him even better is completely mistreated. It feels like all of the main character's potentials get squandered here. There are no more interesting ulterior motives like they had initially, and don't even get me started as Rio. As I said, they took like all the intrigue with this character and they just reduced them to a one note. Hey, Hey, badass character is actually silly and goofy. It, all the characters just kind of feel one note now. There's that whole plot line about them being in jail, and then they're no longer in jail, and it's never brought up again. Why? Why would? What's the point of that? What's the point of doing a two-year time skip concept at all if you're not going to establish changes in the world besides a wardrobe update? Well, even if the heroes were mistreated, at least we have a brand new cast of villains to keep things interesting. Wrong. The Galactic Insects have a badass name, but they are so boring. I was pretty excited for them at first because, as I said, just the novelty of getting a whole new villain to storm in is neat, and Duga de Jarin, the Mandalorian, Douglas D4DJ. Seems like my exact kind of villain. I love villains that are sort of just goobers messing around, but their messing around is like actually cunning. Like it seems like they're just screwing about, but there's actually a plan. Douglas D4DJ has the power and the messing around, but none of the cunning. Like the feeling of him as a threat comes from his superficial ability to throw planets, not because he's messing around and that happens to be an emotional threat to the King Ogers. Also, all of the Galact Insects are just goobers. Like, they're not as powerful as Douglas, but at least, like, all of these dudes are supposed to be cosmically powered entities capable of easily wiping out the King Ogers, and they're just messing around. So none of them have unique personalities. The pink girl, like, speaks a little funny. The ninja has a cool design. The Kamijin is still silly. I like that he's brought back, but, like, now he doesn't- now he does this less than he did in part one. And these are the villains we have to deal with for 20 episodes. Over 20 episodes. The exception to all of this is Grody, because he- he has a personality. He's not just the same character copied and pasted. He's responsible for the whole fury of the gods, the origin story of the main King Ogers, and he just doesn't care. It was a thing he did, but that's that's exciting. And instead of like making him more important than the other jesters, he spends half the show sitting around on his ass, not interacting with anyone. It gets so repetitive to have to fight one of the Galact Insects over and over and over and over and not get anywhere until we introduce immortal killing powers that are probably forgotten and then we introduce more ones and then those are forgotten and then we, then we introduce more again with how wasted these villains are i honestly still wonder why this was the direction the showrunners decided to take the first half feels so radically different not just in terms of escalation but because it's like a political thriller the bugnarok are used as like real impactful entities obviously there's heracles then the opponents shift from that to super space Beans. Gira's origin with the Rainbow Jururia in Kuagan's soul is the result of a space god creating a clone of himself. The big castle robot was originally a spaceship. Uh, yeah, perfectly reasonable evolutions, I guess. 
Now, I'll admit, I wasn't sitting there hating this entire part of the show. The Kyoto to Yudra crossover arc was definitely a highlight for me, maybe for the entire show. It was really fun to have a crossover of this scale nestled into the show. It was like a perfect distillment of Super Sentai spirit. It was a ton of fun. I did talk a lot more about it in its own separate video, so if you'd like to just hear my thoughts on that entirely, go watch that. Also, while I think the actual like development of the King Gojers drops off, their actors are still pretty good. So like, there was never a point where I hated them as characters. Many of their focus episodes are still enjoyable. I do really like how we delve into the lore and backstory for each of them, some of the relationships with the retainers, and I can't bring myself to call any of them bad characters. Also, this might sound weird, but I really love how often the main mecha doesn't appear in part two. I mean, it happens a lot in part one as well, but I think in part two, the first 10 episodes have no mecha fight. It shows me here that like, there's actually some sort of vision that the writers are trying to stick to, even though if maybe I don't fully understand it. There's no last minute, oh boy, here's a monster and it's big now, we have to fight it. If there's a mecha fight, it's a big deal. And if the story doesn't call for a mecha fight, then there's no need for a mecha fight. We can tell another story going on. It's just another part of King Eldred that makes it really unique. And something that wasn't unique but was welcome nonetheless was when Big Rax came back. I mean, we all knew he would be back because that's just how these shows work. But when he came back, it was still incredibly satisfying. And they somehow managed to make him even more compelling than he was in the first arc. Since now he's betraying his brand new space comrades who gain even more power to actually be a good guy and defeat Douglas. I love that he doesn't get a real redemption. It's just a big twist revealing that everything he's been doing in the show has been part of a nearly two decade long plan to defeat the king of the universe and I love the way they tied it into Gira since his big moment in the premiere episode was his acting as a tyrant king to oppose Rackley's justice but it turns out that Rackley's himself has been acting as a tyrant king to appease the will of the cosmos and inspire Gira to action. It's great because it also doesn't feel like it's out of nowhere. It always felt like Big Rax was planning something as we had little lines of dialogue about him missing Gira's organs in order to let him survive and then we have King Gojer Zero and the Immortal Slayer so the reveal that all of these these plans were part of a larger plan to defeat Douglas just makes sense. Of course, this is all one big plan. Why wouldn't it be? And of course, the character's charisma carries over from chapter one. So when he's actually a good guy this time around, you just, well, now you have to believe him. Rackley's Hasti, aka Big Rax Okuagata Ojer, is not only my favorite aspect of this entire season, but he is probably one of my favorite Super Sentai characters of the last decade. The show I, I felt still kind of squandered his full potential. Like after his reintroduction, there was a like chunk of episodes where he's just not in them. There's no check-in on his plan, not even a mention of his name. Why would you introduce the main villain of part one again if you're not going to do anything with him? And then after his redemption too, he joins the King Ogers and just sits in a cage. They could have had like this little arc where he works with each individual king as we go through all the kingdoms again, but now it's with Rackley's and Rackley's is working alongside him and now he's uh, proving himself to be, no, again, this isn't something I have against Rackley's. It's just like, why, why are we doing with this, with this plot line? This show for me, it felt like it always just took one step forward and too many steps back. There are some episodes with like a super serious main plot line, but then there's like a distracting silly B plot that feels like it came from a cartoon. I don't mind silly seasons of Sentai. My favorite Sentai is Zenkaiger. So don't come in the comments and be, well, you have to understand this is a kid show. They have to be silly. It's just that this show didn't set out to be a goofy, silly season. It tried to be just a little bit more serious and it's okay if it wants to be a little goofy, but just don't intercut your serious episodes with that. The thing is, I don't hate Osama Sentai King Ojer. Despite my minor issues, I think the first half is pretty strong. The characters never falter. I really like Rackley's. I can understand why so many people love the show, and I can understand why it's probably gonna go down as like a really beloved season of Sentai. This show really has some incredible highs. That last finale arc probably pushed it a little higher than I was gonna put it initially. There's also just way too many low for me that I have to admit it really wasn't a hundred percent for me. Instead of yelling at me in the comment section, please tell me why you loved Osama Sentai King Ojer, or if you agree with some of my sentiments. I do genuinely want to hear your guys' thoughts. Also, don't forget to subscribe for more upcoming King Ojer content and weekly reviews of Bakuage Sentai Boom Boojer if you don't want to miss more of my Super Sentai thoughts, and I hope to see you next time.